We're in a brand new series called Make Space. Uh, coming up in a few weeks, we'll be celebrating the 11 year anniversary of this church's existence. Yeah. Yeah. Some golf claps and a few hoots. It's great. Uh, it's also the one year anniversary uh, since God allowed me to be the pastor here at this church. Yeah. And um, I am grateful and ecstatic that I get to be a part of what God has done over this last year. And so throughout the year, a couple of times a year, we like to kind of take a pause and talk about what we said we felt like God was leading us to do and kind of update on how we're doing, where are we at in that adventure, in that journey. Now, my battery is going to die any minute now, and I have a battery in my pocket. So we're going to have a pause for station identification while I switch it out really quick, okay? We're going to hope it's quick. I should have done this, but I was too much into the worship to stop. <laughs> Dale Earnhardt's children will be proud of right there. There you go. <laughs> All right. Made the switch. Uh, so we want to take some time to update you over the next couple of weeks about what we said we felt God was leading us to do, where we're at, and what it's going to take to move forward into the future of where we're going. So it's going to be kind of a, a fun, topical series. Uh, you're going to get to hear from a lot of our team talking together, teaching together throughout it, just to kind of relay where we're at as a faith family. If you're new here, you're checking out our church. There's a big question that I want you to ask over the next several weeks. God, is this the kind of crazy people you would have us break bread and spend our lives being a part of? Uh, we believe that if you are a follower of Jesus, church moves from being just what's fancy and what tickles our ears to where are you calling us, Lord, to lay down our life, to represent your gospel, to serve others and love others that are different than us together. And so we believe that if you're a new believer, or if you're a believer and you're new to this church, that you're really trying to discern, God, is this where you would have us pour out our life in a community and in a context to be a witness to this community around us of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So if you're new, is this home? Is this where God would have you break bread and lay down your life? If you're a part of this church, this is really an opportunity for you to hear about how we're moving forward and what it's going to take for us to continue to walk at the Spirit's leadership into the future He's called us to walk in together. So uh, I want to break the sermon down into three parts today. The first part is what He's done. I want to talk to you about where God has brought us in around 11 months of being together and uh, kind of look really more recent at the last four or five months and particularly since we did an update back in the spring. So here's what, where we've been and what God's done. Uh, numbers is usually where most churches start in this story, but let me be very clear. Numbers give you a sign of growth, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're healthy. It does, it does mean that people are curious or at least showing up once you know a month to check it out. But if you look back over 2021 to 2022, the blue is 2021. The green is 2022. If you're colorblind, left, 2021. Right, 2022. Uh, 350 was the average attendance going into summer last year. We averaged 450 in attendance in the month of May. 280 in June, because everybody went to Dirty Myrtle. 427 in June this past summer. 299, 413, 284, and this is called before Clemson and Carolina and everyone's idols started playing football on Saturdays, we averaged 504. We're not there this month because apparently when your team loses or you have a busy weekend, you just take a week or three or four off from church, which is what's happening in the month of September, which has not been really fun. Just being honest, you're here, praise God, but you know, for others, just staring into your soul. We'd love to see you before Christmas. Uh, First-time guests this year. We've had 333 first-time guests that have come to our church. I think we can celebrate that. That's cool. Here's a cooler number. You ready? 229 people came back. That's like two-thirds. Like, I mean, you, you do your best to go get two-thirds of a room to like you and figure out if they'll come back. I mean, it's, it's a hard task, but two-thirds have come back and kept coming to church. Uh, we've had 28 people that have been baptized in Believer's Baptism this year. And I'm going to pause for the celebration, 35 people that have made professions of faith this year at Four Points Church. 
We exist at Four Points to reach the least, the lost, and the lonely with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are here to reach the, the people that other churches aren't reaching, not because we're better than another church, but because we complement other churches. There's lots of churches for lots of different people. We're the kind of church that's for the people that didn't belong at other churches, that got kicked out of other churches, that kind of get side-eyed at other churches. Welcome. We're glad you're here. On top of that, I want to point out one of the greatest strengths of this church has been the commitment that this body has had to being fruitful and multiplying. <laughs> we, about one-third of our church are in elementary school or younger. One-third. It's crazy. It's cool. Yeah, you can clap for that. You can see some numbers of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, the brown represents where we were last year, but the, and, and this is preschool on the left and elementary on the right. We had 61 on average this year, 48 the year prior, 69 on average this year, 47 the year prior in the month of May. Go to June, 60 and 71 averaging this year, which is a big bump up, especially in elementary school. You can see where the growth has been. Uh, also in July, elementary school, and then in August, elementary school through the Roof. So we're growing a lot in our kids' ministries. On top of that, another big thing that's happened that we've started this year is we've been getting back to doing a lot of outreach within our community. We did a Break and Bread for Jesus food drive. We're currently in a Feed the Future food drive. Essentially, if you're going to go to this church and you're trying to figure out, is this the place for me? If you like grocery shopping and bringing food with you to church, then we may be your home. Because after the Feed the Future food drive, which is feeding uh, local school kids all over our community who likely are going without food on weekends, our student ministry is packing the bags of the food that you're bringing, and they're putting it in backpacks of kids at the school so they have food over the weekend. Then we move into Thanksgiving. Around here, we feed around 1,000 people on Thanksgiving Day, and we have a turkey drive. So we're going to move from the Feed the Future drive to the turkey drive. And then we have Angel Tree, which comes with Middle Tiger at the end of that, where we do Christmas with the people that have been working with Middle Tiger Community Center, going through financial classes. And what was cool is we're the first church that's ever had someone that went to their financial classes last year that gave a present to someone this year. They've never had anyone that got help that gave back, but we had it happen. Woo! So yay. Praise God. Uh, we did a work day at Church of the Mill where we tore down a lot of walls. They didn't call us for the construction, but they did call us for the deconstruction. I don't know what that says about us as a church. Uh, we, we, we take breakfast once a month to a local school or lunch and serve them. We'd love for you to be a part of that. We did a DSS backpack where we packed uh, and wrote handwritten letters to every DSS employee in Spartanburg County just to tell them thank you for the work that they do. We brought the entire Burns track team in this past year and had them in for dinner. There were so many of them uh, that it got a little scary and a little sketchy. They all got up on the stage and started doing church clap, and the stage is still here. Praise God. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we're doing Feed the Future right now. On top of that, we added monthly missions partners. When, we, when you give faithfully, we give faithfully into other missionaries and other opportunities, both locally and around the world. Some of those that we've built partnership with, Cecil and Tracy Ramos in Thailand, the first Christian church in a village of 10,000. Uh, Akeem Smith and his wife Jamie planted a church in Oakland, California that we're continuing to build partnership with them there. Jason Reed, church at Piedmont Mill, planting a church down in Piedmont, South Carolina that's launching here in just a few weeks. Lucas Vanderwalker. Fellowship of Christian Athletes, we support him and the ministry he's doing all of Spartanburg. Many of you have gotten involved in that. And Harrison and Lauren Smith, who are serving about 50,000 college students in an area of the Middle East where there's less than 1% Christian in that area. So when you give faithfully, we get to give into other mission partners. On top of that, we've given $27,183 into missions this year through your generosity and tithes and offerings. Yes, yes, yes. Now... All those things are good news. But, believe it or not, there's grumbling that happens when growth happens. And, and I know it's a shocker, but a lot of us ask for God to bless us, and then God blesses us, and life gets more complex, and then we get frustrated. Because a blessed life is not a simple life, it's a complex life. And when God blesses you with more, you got to steward more. Last I heard, heating and cooling 1,300 is a little bit different than heating and cooling 2,500 square feet. Having one car, uh, when, you add two, when you go from one to two cars, that, that, that increases the bills and the cost and fuel cost and insurance and everything else. And apparently you're supposed to vacuum them once a year and clean them out and find that cup that your kid 
had in the back that had stuff in it that's now turned into another form of substance, and you don't, you don't know what it is anymore. See, a blessed life is a complex life. Uh, the Bible teaches us that children are a blessing from the Lord, but how many know that children don't make sleep in life simple? So it's a blessing, but it's not simple. A lot of you said, God, if I could just marry them. Well, now you're married to them. You've been blessed, but it's not simple. It's complex. In fact, one of my favorite preachers says it this way, Pastor Craig Rochelle, he says, complexity creates, or growth creates complexity, and complexity, if not dealt with, kills growth. And where we're at as a church is we've seen (laughs) extensive growth that has happened in the house that has caused a unique set of challenges. Even with half of our church being not here because, you know, Newberry had a football game yesterday. That's where everybody clearly was, right? Do we have other football teams other than Newberry and the PC Blue Hose? The North Greenville University of Christian Knights, what are, what are they? The Crusaders. I don't should know that. My, my wife went there. So here, here's what I've learned about life and blessings. Here, growth causes change. Change causes complexity. Complexity causes chaos. We've been there recently. Chaos causes concern. We've heard that recently. And concern causes conflict. And for us as a church, in order for us to move forward, we're going to have to deal with the challenge that's come with the blessing of God adding around 150-ish adults that have started coming to this church in the last year And with them, about the 600 children they brought. (laughs) And in order for us to be able to move forward and be faithful to what God has called us to do, we kind of have to have a family meeting and go, all right, here's here's where we're at. Our elders have fasted. They've prayed. They've been wrestling with this. We've really been behind closed doors meeting and praying and working through it and asking God, how do we address where we're at so that we can continue to move in the direction that you would call us to go into our future? Now, here's the good news. We're not the only church that's ever experienced exponential growth and had to deal with the challenges that come with it. There's this little book that we've been in called the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 6, the complexity of growth brings significant challenges to the early church. And in it, I think we can find some instruction for what it looks like for you and I. Uh, to take on this challenge as a faith family to move forward into the future God has for us. Look at it with me. Acts 6, verse 1. But as believers rapidly multiplied. I want you to pay attention to that word, multiplied. We've seen God do a lot of math in the book of Acts. Uh, In Acts 2, he added to their number daily. In Acts 5, he subtracted from their number. So we know that God's into addition and he's into subtraction. Ananias and Sapphira deceived or tried to deceive God. They also tried to deceive the early church community. They fell down dead. God brought judgment, righteous judgment on them for their sin. Reverent fear broke out through the subtraction of those believers. And as a result, they continued to grow. Chapter 6 picks up with the fact that they've multiplied. But we also know that chapter 5 is the first time that another character in the Bible who's real, not a fake idea or anything, a fallen angel named Satan shows up in Ananias and Sapphira, fills their heart to deceive and to lie, and he's still at work in chapter 6 because he brings in a form of mathematics that God never does. He tries to divide. You see, God adds, God multiplies, sometimes when necessary, God subtracts, But God does not divide. Division is the devil's playground. Division is what God is what the is what the enemy seeks to do in churches and in families and in marriages, at work and in other places. He seeks to bring divisions where there need not be division. So the believers rapidly multiplied, verse one. There were rumblings of discontent. Let's just call it what it is. Gossip began to break out. Gossip happens when you talk to somebody about something that they can affect no change over. That's how you know you're gossiping. See, a lot of times we're like, well, I don't want to gossip. But if you're talking to someone who can affect change over the problem, that's actually not gossip. That's actually responsibility. But what a lot of us love is not the beauty of conflict resolution. It's the conflict stirring up. It's conflict planning. 
How can we create more conflict? How can we make this worse than it needs to be? Let me give you a few real quick tips if you want to create it worse than it needs to be. Talk about people between your ears instead of to their face. See, some of you came in this morning arguing with someone you ain't even had a conversation with. And you feel good about it, but ain't no resolution been brought to it. Yeah, you're, you're just sitting here stirring it around in your head. And I, I get it, you don't like this because it's too practical. But for a lot of you, in a, lot of me, a lot of times with me, me and my wife, we are having an argument with each other, then neither one of us know that we're actually in the argument. My favorite rule that I've instituted amongst our staff is that if you're talking, if you're talking about me in your head, go ahead and pick up the phone and call. Or come and knock on my office. Like, we're not going to play around in the devil's playground or practice in a conversation. Because that's what a lot of us do. Well, I like to practice what I'm going to say so that you can get mad when it doesn't go in the real conversation the way that you practice saying it. So then not only are you mad because you have a conflict, you're now mad because it didn't play out the way you thought it was supposed to play out in your head. So they're murmuring amongst each other. Eventually it gets up to the disciples. Look at what it says. The problem was that Greek-speaking believers complained about Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of the food. So if the rule was you get two loaves, what was happening is the Greek-speaking believers were looking at what the Hebrew believers were giving their widows, and they were getting two good-sized loaves, and in their mind, their loaves were smaller. Or if they ran out, it was always the Greek widows that were having to bear the brunt of going without because the Hebrew believers were getting what they thought was theirs. Now, whether or not it was completely real or not is beside the point because within the faith family, no matter what your culture, your ethnicity, your economic status, or your background are before you walked in this door, we in Christ Jesus have been made family. There's no, no longer, according to Galatians, rich or poor, Jew or Greek. But we are all in Christ, and we have our unity around Christ, and as a result of it, we are given the opportunity to go back to the divisions of our culture with the gospel of Christ to proclaim to them. And this is how God reaches the world. He brings a diverse people that are unified around something greater than their divisions in the world within the church. He reminds them of the gospel, fills them and inspires them with the Holy Spirit, sends them for his mission, and we go across the cultural bridges that we once walked coming into the church, back out to proclaim the gospels of the people that we have influence and effective, uh, 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 an effective impact with as we spread the gospel to the nations that God has sent us to be around. So they're complaining, they're murmuring, they're talking about this because the distribution of food is not happening in their mind equally. So verse 2, the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are all respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility. All right, here's the deal. Growth creates complexity. What's the complexity? Well, you've got people from different, uh, different uh, cultural backgrounds of the same ethnicity, they all have some kind of Jewish tie in the early church, but some of them speak Greek, some of them originally speak Hebrew, some of them are Aramaic in their language. I know that doesn't mean a lot to you, but just imagine what would happen, and I would hope it does someday, if you got like a whole bunch of Spanish-speaking, first native Spanish speakers, a whole bunch of French and German speakers in the house with a bunch of English speakers, and we have that cultural background and the holidays that we celebrate that are tied within that, and we get all that together and we're trying to figure out how the gospel makes us family. It would get a little messy, right? Would it be a blessing? Absolutely it would be a blessing. I mean, this is a reflection, should it happen, of Revelation 7, where every nation, tribe, and tongue come together around the throne of God. That's the end picture, so let's just get to practicing it now. Does this make sense? And so, so, so we're, we're seeing the tension that comes. How do they deal with it? The first thing the disciples do is they don't diminish the complaint. They deal with the complaints. Not every complaint is a bad thing. Some complaints are a recognition of needs and an opportunity for growth in ministry and development. We, we don't do everything that we can do because not everything we could do are things that we should do. The same is true for you. But there are some things that as we develop, we should begin doing. And some of the time, I know this is shocking, your barefoot pastor doesn't see every need that's happening within our church. And there are moments where you recognize a need, maybe on the basis of experience or through the sharing of other stories that's happening in our church, and the idea is not a burden to the ministry staff, it's not something we're going to diminish or push away, but it's an opportunity for development of the church to better reach the needs and su supply the needs of the church that are around us. So we've got to deal with the complaints that come up because of growth. 
See, the complaint is that people are being overlooked. Here's what happened later in church history, and excavations have gone back and seen this. They're going to come to a resolution in Acts 6, but it won't last. What's going to be discovered later in church history is that Hellenists had their own temples separate from the Aramaic-speaking Christians. They separated. They divided. They made denominations. And as a result of these denomination lines, they were able to divide and say, we're the real deal while they're the not deal. There's us and there's them. And that's not a division God ever made within his kingdom. Last I checked, there's a whole lot of crazy in the kingdom of God. I mean, there's Peter and John and Thomas who always doubted. Peter's hacking ears off. I mean, it's a mess. And if church isn't a little messy, I'm not sure God's in it. Let me just remind you of that. If it's not a little messy, God may not be in it. It may be a country club where members have rights but not responsibilities. Where everyone's being served by the talents of a few. I said a couple of weeks ago, it's one of my favorite analogies. Football is a really good analogy for what a lot of church is. It's 100,000 people watching 22 people in need of rest while the 100,000 who are watching really need exercise. You've got to deal with the complaints. The complaint was that people were being overlooked. There was a need. And here's what you need to see. There is a threat to the unity of the church based on the complexity of the growth that it's brought in. And on this side of eternity, unity will always, when you experience it and see it within a local church, it will always be something that was fought for, not something that just happened. Unity on this side of eternity is fought for. You find a couple that hits 60 years of marriage and they're still holding hands at Cracker Barrel, rocking on the chairs. Okay, that was fought for. They went through tough seasons and droughts and difficulties and arguments and cold wars. And and Satan came against that marriage and tried to divide it multiple times. They had kids and they went through like a 10-year drought because the kids every night lined the bed. So if dad rolled over to hug mom, to apologize to mom, all he got was a stinky junior. I'm not speaking from experience. I'm just trying to say that they've been through some stuff. They've been through some stuff. Date night became a five-minute drive to the grocery store to pick up a Lunchable at 10.30. Praise God. They've been through it. They fought for it. Unity, when you experience it, when you see it, is something that is fought for. It doesn't just happen naturally, but that is something that we have to steward. It's one of the main battles in this house is for us to stay together because there's going to be times where you're going to want to murmur instead of love. There's going to be times where you're going to want to gossip instead of forgive. There's going to be times where you want to dismiss or reject or ignore or divide instead of unify and get around a group of people that aren't like you who actually may be used by God to sharpen you because they're the sandpaper that disagrees and doesn't say, hey, I agree with everything you're saying all the time. So that you just think, man, I can walk on water and be my own serviceable Savior. No, they remind you you're not Jesus. They remind you you need Him. They remind you that that you're, uh, apart from God, still a broken person. And that your viewpoint isn't always God's view on everything. See, Jesus prayed for unity in the book of John. The Apostle Paul writes multiple letters talking about unity. Some of the places, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 verse 10. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other let there be no that's not god's work that's satan's work in the church let there be no division in the church rather be of one mind united in thought and purpose uh it goes on in philippians he writes it to them in the church of philippi above all you must live as citizens of heaven that's a great question how's your citizenship Are, are are you living for what matters in heaven on earth I'm serious. Like, we're serious about this stuff. That's why we keep seats open. Like, we, we actually try and do it, and then people are like, you really meant that, huh? I'm like, yeah. Reconcile. Forgive. I don't want to do that. Well, stay here and continue to allow the Holy Spirit to press down on you or run. Like, it's, it's really when you're confronted in your sin, you either repent or you run. Right? When you confront your kids about their sin, they either acknowledge it or they what? And a lot of you have been looking like your kids in front of God lately. 
trying to cover up as if he can't see. No, no, citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner that's worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come to see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. He goes on in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, and he says this, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. In the book of Romans, he says, As far as it be up to you, live in peace with one another. Why is he repeating the constant call to unity? Because unity doesn't just happen. We don't drift towards simplicity. We drift towards complexity. We don't drift towards unity. We drift towards disunity and division. And so whenever we face growth in the gifts that God has given us, it will bring, yes, good things and good things to look at and celebrate, but great complexities and challenges where we have to pick up the battle for unity. Now let me explain how you fight for unity. This is how you fight for unity. You ready? While we are saints in Christ, we still make simple choices that make unity impossible. Without active repentance, unity requires an active acknowledgement that there are times where to various degrees, because a lot of us like to weigh who's more uh, wrong than the other, but to various degrees, there are times where we have to deal with the fact that we have wronged or hurt intentionally or unintentionally other believers around us. So we have to actively repent, and in order to fight for unity, we have to receive and consistently extend grace, mercy, and forgiveness. If you want to fight the battle for unity, you're going to have to be an active repenter. That means you're not shocked that you failed. Don't be a politician. Be a Christian. Don't be like the world that's trying to cover up everything and act like they're, they're perfect and demonize someone else. No, no. We lead in repentance. Why? Because you can't be rejected. So why hide in the darkness? Why act as if his mercy and grace isn't sufficient for you? Acknowledge your wrongs to each other. Acknowledge when you fall short. Be humble about the fact that you don't bat a thousand and none of us are expecting you to. And if you've got a bunch of people that are expecting you to be perfect, then get a new friend. On top of that, we're active in repentance in the battle for unity, but we then have to not only repent, but receive at times. Because for a lot of us, we can acknowledge we're wrong, but we've never done anything but hang our head in acknowledging that wrong instead of receiving grace and mercy and forgiveness and knowing that you've been set free. Yes, I've messed up, but I am forgiven. I am redeemed. I have been set free from my shame. I am not defined by my failure or my victories. I am defined by the fact that my Savior was with me and leading me out of my failure, and he stands with me whenever I experience the victory in my life. So I actively repent and at times receive, and at other times, whenever I've been sinned against, I extend grace and mercy and forgiveness. You know how many people over 11 years have left this church because we couldn't extend grace and mercy to them? And it's supposed to be abundant in the house. Last I checked, the plumb line's not broke this way. God's got plenty of grace and mercy and forgiveness that he's given us. So if the line's not broken here, it's got to be broken here. So we've got to deal with the fact that for some of us, we don't let go of anything. And that's a sign at best of Christian immaturity or at worst, of a cultural Christianity that's not Christian at all. Because you lack the ability to actually extend what Jesus is giving you to others around you. Now, in, order, in order to fight for unity, you've got to not only actively repent and receive, at times you've got to extend grace, mercy, and forgiveness. So they acknowledge the problem. Then, number two, they check their priorities. And this is where we've been. We're acknowledging, okay, there's complexity that's come with this growth. We've got more kids than we can hold in that hall over there. What are we going to do? How are we going to meet the challenge? Where do we go? So we're checking priorities. What do we do? What are the methods we need to deploy? What are the changes we need to make? You see, the disciples don't immediately jump into meeting the need themselves, which is what most of us think church is. Oh, there's a problem. The pastor fixes it. I know you've heard this, but we actually mean it here. I know it's crazy. If it's in the book, we mean it. Here it goes. You ready? You are a royal priesthood. You have been given spiritual 
gifts. And for some of you, it's time to get off your blessed assurance and use them. Because Jesus is going to return, and I sure would hate for you to be an inactive soldier in the army of God at that return. Well, I needed to rest. A decade's probably long enough, pumpkin. Get your boots on and get back to work. You've got to check your priorities. What does that mean? Not everything's the pastor's job. This church will grow at the capacity of this community to love, extend, and move. Not at the capacity of the preacher to preach. We have proven that he can preach sermons that go over weekly. The time that has been allotted to him. Not at the capacity of the worship team to sing. They can sing, y'all. Sing. Not sing. Sing. Yeah, that's what you do in the South. You put an A in it, and you, you just put some extra stuff on it. And that's how you know. They really singing down there. Where I'm from, we call it a hootenanny, but I'm, they can do that. Some of you are going to have to Google what a hootenanny is. It's, it's a banjo. You stomp your foot. It's great. The disciples don't immediately jump into the need themselves. Instead, they evaluate the cost of them stopping what they are doing so that they can meet the need that has now been presented before them. You see, what they know and what we need to learn is that our yeses to new things are almost always no to something else. And you've got to ask yourself the question, is this a yes I can give because of the no that it's going to mean to somewhere else in my life? This is a tough question to deal with. You see, teaching the word must not be neglected. They have to preach the word. It's the way that God has chosen to reach the lost. It's the way that God has chosen to educate and teach about his character and who he is. So preaching must continue. And preaching requires time. Look at what it says later in the text. The twelve called them together. They said, find seven men among you who are well respected, full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility, then we apostles can spend our time, because we all get a limited amount of it. So we're like, I need three more hours. Why? So you can continue to abuse what you already aren't stewarding. You don't need more hours in a day. God fixed us with limitations so that we would have to steward what he has given us. Look, they're going to spend their time in what? In prayer and teaching the word. Here's what I want you to see. This is for all of us. Our prayer life privately overflows into our public ministry. So their prayer led them into public ministry publicly. So they prayed and they preached. The average preacher in the United States of America, according to a latest Gallup poll, uh, prays. I thought it was three and a half minutes a week. It's three and a half minutes a day. Pastors that spend their whole day, three and a half minutes of it gets put in prayer. Yet, 1 Thessalonians says pray continually, and we look at you and go pray continually. Now here's why some pastors, beyond a discipline problem and a yes problem, are continuing down this path. A lot of it has to do with the fact that we put expectations on pastors to do everything but pray. Then we wonder why when they pray, not a lot happens. Because they ain't had a conversation all week with them until you brought the crisis to them and asked them and demanded them to pray because they had to run every other ministry in between the week. So there was no consistent prayer life that overflowed into public ministry. Instead, prayer was just another like task on the task list of 100 million things that everyone expected the preacher to do. His wife doesn't love Jesus. His kids don't love Jesus anymore. And they're going to walk away from the faith because dad can't be at home and engage with them. That's not the current state of my house, but I, I'm just trying to tell you, I will not go there because I've watched the story happen. I will leave the church before I will leave my family in the post of being the spiritual leader over it. If it comes down, look, no, no, don't clap yet. Don't clap yet, because before you give me applause for this, you better hold me accountable to it, number one. And number two, you better be ready to do it in your own life. Because for some of you, you're saying yeses to raises that are meaning no to family, and you're raising the same problem. For some of you, you're saying yeses to jobs, and it means no to getting to date, and that you're, it's the same problem. And you're like, oh, yeah, pastor, you do that. No, you do that, too. Know what your yes means no to. 
Be firm about it. No, we can't go and do that. Why? Because we haven't read the Bible as a family, and we're going to spend the night eating dinner with the TV off, and then we're going to sit in a hallway and pray together and spend time together, and my kids are going to complain about it, and they're not going to like it because they would rather be at the football, whatever, number five game of the week. But instead, we're going to be at home because this is where we can't say no to our own family's spiritual development. To our own pursuit of Christ. Some of y'all, I ain't got time to read the Bible. There's seven Bibles in the average American home, according to Barna. Seven. Seven. Some of you ain't cracked one this year on your own. And you're like, why am I so spiritually out of whack? Because you're not reading the Bible, Thunder. In the 1500s, thought it was the 1600s, they invented something called the printing press. People died to get printed words of the Word of God in your hand. And then we go, oh, doesn't that look good on the coffee table? Won't they think I'm spiritual when they come over and it sits there? No, read the thing. Read it. That's the whole point. Read it. Check your priorities. Not every need you see in the church is your burden to carry. Not every need you see at work is your burden to carry. Not every opportunity is your opportunity. Some yeses mean no's to things that you can't say no to. This is heavy on my heart, guys. We've got to get this right. Not, not just within the church, but within your family. It matters. It matters. We're unavailable to the work of God because we have made ourselves through our yeses unavailable. Or we've made ourselves through our yeses available to everything else but His work. So there's no margin for mission, no margin for ministry development, no margin for growth, but there is margin for complaints and murmuring and being stressed out and overwhelmed and overtasked, freaking out, all because we didn't know that our yes to these things meant no to things that we weren't ready to say no to. So notice the remedy. The remedy is not the disciples do more. The, the remedy is all the new people that have come into the church do something. Amongst them, there's been a group of seven men that are going to be brought up that have many of them. Uh, we don't hear about them in church history ever again. Two of them we know a lot about because a lot's going to happen in the next few chapters with them, Stephen and Philip. We know that they're from different cultural backgrounds, which is really cool. So the people they bring in are people that were actually from the backgrounds that were being kind of marginalized. So they gave seats at the table within the ministries of the church for people that weren't like them or didn't think like them. So they grow in diversity of thought which is a really cool concept that a lot of churches haven't caught on to yet. And, and, and out of it, new ministry flourishes, and we get the results of it. Look at verse 4. Uh, at the end of it, we the apostles will spend our time praying and teaching the Word. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and, and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven men were presented to the apostles who prayed for them, and laid their hands on him, commissioned him to the work. So, here's what happened. God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly, what are we at? Are we at division or are we at multiplication again? Greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Here's the deal. We are growing out of the seams with good stuff everywhere. Mainly kids everywhere. They're, they're all over. It's like baby Jack-Jack in Incredibles 2. He just, it's like, he just gets mad, and there's like six more of them. We're like, where'd y'all come from? It's been awesome. But it's created a space challenge. We have run out of space here to do ministry. Now, we are never going to become a church that makes our aim a building. The building is the means to deploy saints to the nations, to equip you so that there's a generation that someday isn't paying rent that's coming out of the tithe, but is able to take the money that's coming in through the offerings of the church and put even more of it to work for planting new churches and new ministries and sending missionaries and equipping and sending more saints to the nations. This is the goal, that we would be able to spend more in the future on those who are in, in need and hurting, that our benevolence budget would grow as our building budget diminishes. But in order to do that, we know that we've got to make space somewhere. So we've been praying and asking God, God, where are we going and what are we doing? Because we were given the opportunity to expand and open up the walls and go that way. But it came at a steep cost that would handicap ministries. That would put around 
a quarter of a million dollars into something we would never get back and still be with a space problem likely in three years. So through a lot of wisdom and wrestling and praying, our elders came back and they said, no, no, we, we, we can't go that way. We need to squeeze everything we can out of what we got because we believe in less than four years there is a building, there is a piece of land, there is a space that God will lead us to to reach this area that we're in with the gospel that we've not had. So we believe we're less than four years away from finding a new church building and home where we can equip and send saints. It's about the people that get us there and will be the reason we need it, not about the building so that we have a space that we can point at and go, hey, look at how fancy that is. No, no, no. Church buildings age. They require lots of maintenance. The whole point of the church building is that we're sending. And if we're not sending, it becomes a museum and it shuts down. You're tracking with me. So we believe we're less than four years away from that, but there's a lot of work that we've got to do in this house to get it ready. The first step is we're going into a full renovation of our kids' ministry space and a lot of this building to make every square inch usable. I mean, we're about to become the IKEA church. Literally, everything's going to be used for storage where it can be used and space for kids. And uh, We're not going to put your kid in the closet, but your adult small group may end up meeting in a closet. I, I hear a lot of prayer can happen in closets, so we're going to just start meeting with a group in it. I mean, we're, we're going to squeeze it. And so we're, we're about to take some of the proceeds that came off the sale of that land, put them into renovating this, cosmetic stuff on the kids, expanding some space within the kids. We're even going to find an extra office because Austin's literally been in a closet since the beginning of this church. If you've never seen his office, don't worry. You don't need to see it because it's just a closet that he sits in with a few bobbleheads and some Diet Coke. We love him. Amen. So we're going to renovate the existing space. We're praying that God would open up the right door and window for us to purchase some land. We've got the, the money that we had off of the sale of the land sitting in a 2% interest uh, account, savings account, where it's gaining 2%. It's completely liquid. We can take it out whenever we need to. So when the right piece of land comes, we've got cash on hand and we're ready. But it's got to be in the right space because we're uniquely not close to everybody. Are we Duncan? Are we Woodruff? Are we Reedville? Are we Sugar Tit? Yes. Are we Five Forks in Abner Creek? Yes. We got people driving from TR. We got people driving from Gray Court. Are we that? Yes. We're wherever your feet go, that's us. And so we're uniquely positioned for it. We're going to purchase some land. Then after that comes everyone's favorite thing. And some of you are like, man, we were praying about whether or not this was our church, and we just found out this is not our church. Because after we buy that land, guess what we're going to do? A building campaign. Where we're going to ask those of you who call this church your home to sacrifice in the way that you live your life for a short period of time so that we can purchase and build what we need to build to equip and send the saints because Jesus is going to come back. And I don't want to be lazy when he gets back, not walking in faith, but sitting on what we have with closed hands. So we're going to go into a building campaign after we purchase that land. After that, we'll break ground. After breaking ground, we're going to be in the building. We believe that sometime between now, today, and 2026, it's subject to change and become earlier, but we don't believe it will be much later because otherwise I believe some of this murmuring is going to get out of hand and we're going to have to like go to nine services and then you're going to have to get a coffin because I'm going to climb in it and die. That's where we're going. Here's, that, here's the question. Will you go with us? It's an all-in moment for your family. Hey, if you've been here... Uh, if you've been here in the last year, would you just raise your hand? If you came within the last year, come on, can we welcome all the new people that have been coming to our church? Okay. If you've been here more than three or four years, would you raise your hand? Three or more? Yeah. Can we give it up for the OGs? OGs. Here's the deal. All of us have to go all in into the future. God's been faithful to get us to this point, but we're going to have to trust in his faithfulness to go to where he's calling us to go next. That means, look, there's some incredible things that have happened over 11 years of ministry in this church. Incredible things that have positioned us to be in the position that we're in. And for some of you, you're still thinking about those old things, and they're keeping you from being able to move forward into this new thing. And you've got to decide, am I going to go forward or not? If not, let me graciously say to you, we love you. And we desire your growth more than we desire your attendance. You are not obligated to be here. You get to be here. And if we are no longer the faith family where you need to be, then we bless you and send you to the next faith family where God will grow and multiply your ministry efforts so that more can be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
There's no harm in that. For some of you, look, look, some of you, your first step today is you need to do less because you're doing so much that you're maxing out your family, you're maxing out your relationships, you have no time to do anything effectively, and for some of you, you're doing 80% of the work in this church and you need to do less of it so that others can pick up the ball. What's going to fall? Let it fall until someone comes by and goes, what's that? Oh, that's your ministry opportunity. Pick it up. <laughs> Praise God. Won't he do it? For those of you that are new, look, we're not your old church. We're not your past church history. I can't compete with church hurt from the past that I had no problems, that I, that I did not inflict upon you. I'm going to create my own problems. And I'm going to have to ask for forgiveness. And you're going to have to extend grace to me. But I can't compete with whatever you liked about your old church and everything you didn't like and being put on a pedestal, being an idol in your heart. That's the worst thing to be in. Because if they deify you in a season, they'll demonize you in the next one. Be, be aware of it. So I, I, I need you to go all in. What does that look like? Well, it's what we talked about. You've got to forgive. You've got to extend grace. You've got to receive grace. You've got to move forward. You've got to trust that God's not lost hold of your life, that he's faithful, he's just, he's true, he's near. His grace is sufficient for you, and he's led us to this point so that we can look at this future and go, man, what is this going to mean for our kids and the next generation that comes behind us? So I'm asking you to go all in with me. Over the next few weeks, this is what we're going to talk about. Next week, we're talking about supporting the house. I'll leave it up to your imagination as to where that's going to go. The week following, we're going to talk about serving the house. And then we're going to pack the house because it's our 11-year anniversary. And we want you to invite all your friends and your neighbors to come. It's going to be a lot of fun. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Some of you go, that's the stuff I don't like to talk about. And if that's what you just thought, you've got to come. Because that's where you're going to spiritually grow or be immature in. It's the way it works. It's usually the stuff that's like the, the fingernails on the chalkboard that are actually the areas where God's trying to grow you. So don't look at that and go, well, I'm not going to come on that week because that's just the stuff that I don't like to hear. No, that means there's an immaturity or a wound that needs to be healed. So we should have a packed house for support the house. We should have a packed house or serve the house. Because if we're going to go where God's calling us to go, it's going to take a whole lot of you doing more than plopping, praying, and paying and leaving. Come on, church. This is such a great opportunity. Our prayer team's here. We're excited about where we're going. We want to serve you, though, and pray for you. If you have prayer needs in your life, uh, you move as we respond. We would love to pray with you during this time, but we're excited about where we're going, and we're asking you to prayerfully consider whether or not this is the place that God would have you to move forward into the future for His name together. You move us to the release. In Jesus' name.